Uh, my name is David Todd. I'm here for the Conservation History Association of Texas. We're on the Rice University campus in, in, uh, in Houston. It's November 13, 2004. And um, we're all meeting here as part of the Lynn Lowry Symposium that was put on by uh, Peckerwood Garden. And it's given us a chance to talk to a lot of people who um, knew Lynn Lowry well, who was a, a noted plantsman, uh, plant collector, plant prospector, plant propagator. And um, he, the symposium has made it possible for us to uh, meet right now with Carl Schoenfeld, who um, has had an interesting career with uh, both Peckerwood Garden and, and is currently the owner and operator of uh, Yuckadoo Nursery. And I uh, wanted to thank him now for taking the time to talk to us about Lynn and Lynn's impact on his life. Um, Carl, could, could you help us start by telling us how you first became aware of Lynn Lowry or how you first met him? Uh, first uh, heard about Lynn through uh, working at you know, Peckerwood Garden where I worked at uh, as a college student. And uh, it came initially, uh, the name associated with plants. You know, they would be a uh, particular penstemon, whether it was native or exotic, uh, that was being passed around. And it always came with the, um, kind of like the initials, so this came from Lynn, or Lynn had collected this somewhere. Or, um, so it, it, it's rather strange, because I try to recall you know, when I first met Lynn, and, and I really don't recall the first meeting, because it's like you're so slowly introduced to him because he had a legend kind of going at the time, that when I finally did meet him, um, uh, it was no different than the plants and all the information that I'd heard about him. So it was, it was rather kind of, um, I don't know whether I should be shocked and ashamed that I don't recall, or, but it, it's interesting how it evolved. Uh, so I, and and. I didn't meet Lynn until really the last nine years of his life, so I, I actually met him after he had owned uh, the numerous nurseries that he had around the state and the landscape jobs that he had done for people in Houston and in around. So uh, I really kind of came in at the tail end, and uh, I knew him then, of course, you know, when he was older, and... Um, I know one of the things that I really liked uh, or most impressed me about Lynn is when I did meet him for the first time is, is that you're immediately aware that you're dealing with a special person. Um, and that was my immediate sense is that, and I guess everyone has d done this, where they met someone and in their mind it clicks and they go, I need to treat this like it's the last time I'll meet this person. And that's what how I dealt with Lynn because he was so humble. And, and, and you may ask, you know, what, what do you mean by that? Well, he, he allowed everyone to come to him and bring, whether it was plants or information, and he let it unfold in your own mind. He didn't add to it by inserting his position in time, like, oh, I collected that. 18, you know, in 1980s over by so-and-so, where did you find it? It was like, oh, wow, you ought, to, you ought to do this with it, or you ought to try it in the ground, or uh, let me get some, I mean, I like some seeds of that. And that's what immediately stuck in my mind, is how differently this person operated, how he thought. And uh, the pictures give it away. If you notice, you saw all these pictures of Lynn. You notice he's always looking to the ground. He's always kind of almost kind of bent over. It almost uh, kind of is a character of his, his humbleness because he rarely would look at you in the eyes when he was talking. Like, we'd, he'd never talk like this. It just wasn't, just wasn't in his character. It just didn't happen. And uh, when you meet people like that, it, it does stick in your mind. And so maybe that's why when trying to recall when I first met him, it's like the first time I did meet him, I treated it so special, and every time after that, uh, just being constantly aware that you know this is a very rare individual, and uh, and, and and you notice that with a lot of people, even uh, like right now, this is ten years later. My secretary that I have at my business, uh, she had gone to Lynn Lowry's nursery, 
And I asked her, I said, you know, here I've been writing this paper for three weeks trying to describe a person who really deserved to be spoken about and mentioned. And uh, I asked her, I said, what were your impressions? And there was like two words that came out of her mouth. And, and it was uh, humble, giving, well, three words, uh, uh, and very generous. And I questioned her more about that. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she says, well, you know, we don't know much about plants. But he made you feel like you did. So he was really good at jumping in at whatever level a person was and operating within it and cultivating it. That's why I always say he really engendered a lot of uh, interest in plants and a love of plants. Because he let people unwind themselves or discover themselves. He never acted like a, a, a kind of a student professor sort of relationship. It just wasn't that way. Um, it sounds like he, he cultivated people like he might have a plant. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's a very good analogy to make because every person and every seed and every circumstance is different. And uh, he really was that way, uh, uh, very spontaneous. You'd go to see him and, and uh, if it was around lunchtime, uh, he says, oh, let's get something to eat. And we'd go off and go get something to eat. And then you never went directly to the restaurant. Oh, look over there, or, or, or you're going down this road and he remembers a certain plant or uh, something he hadn't seen before and he turned the truck around and we'd go over there and investigate it. He really was an observer. He really was aware of the environment that, was in, that he was in. And, and as maybe some of the other speakers here would have mentioned, you, I found out along the way he was colorblind. So it was interesting when we were at times looking for plants with specific colors that later on I found out, well, he was colorblind, you know. There's a lot of these sort of paradoxes that were going on with Lynn. But eventually we would eat, and uh, it may be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. His sense of time was really different, too, because he wasn't really regimented whatsoever. And, and I can see, you know, how that would make it difficult for people to deal with Lynn, I mean his family. You know, we look at it strictly as his contributions he did to horticulture and, and uh, gardening and, and all of the other activities associated with uh, growing, growing plants. Uh, so it's, it's, you can imagine how difficult it would have been on his family. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we always look at the positive, but there's a negative to it. I mean, his spontaneity is like, tomorrow, uh, I want to go to Mexico. Would you like to go? And you're special in the sense that he asked you to go in the first place. And how could you say no? And so it, you know, that's like our first trip to Mexico is that happened that way. It unfolded that we just happened to be at his uh, son-in-law's nursery. And Lynn was there. And he said, well, I, I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. Would you like to join me? And that's how it started, our very first trip to Mexico. And, Tell us uh, about the trip. Well, the trip really opened up. Uh, my whole way of thinking, not only just in uh, horticulture, but where we are in the world. You know, when you're, you're, when you're raised uh, in and around your communities, uh, where I grew up in San Antonio, just north of, San, north of the city, near Bernie, uh, I knew that climate. I knew the terrain. I knew the people. And on a little larger scale, I, I, I knew... Uh, uh, other cities and other places that we would travel within Texas, and it was relatively the same. If you've traveled from Uvalde to Houston, there really isn't that much difference. But when you go to Mexico, you realize where we are. And when I say we, it's like where you where do you sit geologically and, cli and climate-wise. And that's very important. You, you realize that you know most of Texas is really a crossroads, you know, the Great Plains to the north, the Great Piney Woods to the east, the Tamalipan savanna to the south, and then the Chihuahuan Desert, the rugged mountains in, of the Sierra Madre Oriental to the west. Then you start seeing where you are. And that's very important if you're going to grow something because 
unless you know where you are, it's very difficult to know how to deal with what you're trying to cultivate. You look at it as just failures. But when you go into these other regions, you can say, oh, well, that's why that doesn't grow. Because of this you know, elevation or amount of uh, heat gain or the amount of cold chill that's needed for something to flourish. Well, Lynn opened up Mexico. So here we go, Mexico. Flat, Tomalipan scrub, which I was familiar with, you see in South Texas, but all of a sudden in the distance, this hazy kind of blue mountains, real mountains, not just the hill country. This looks like maybe what Colorado would look like, and which I hadn't seen. So here it was, midsummer, hot, see blue mountains, a rugged sort of chain in the distance, and kind of billowing clouds on top of it, and we get closer and closer. And literally, you watch the the flora, the plant, and the and the the geography slowly unfold. It went from low elevation scrub to a transition between plants, particularly like the yuccas, became larger, more animated, more uh, looked like little people, and were up to uh, ten meters tall. Whereas the yuccas that I were familiar with, roys, man sized, they were like six feet tall. Now these things were giants. These were Golothic. I mean. Goliath, and uh, so that was, it made sense. I mean, we're going from one point to the next point, so you saw this transition. We got into the mountains, and these were real mountains, sheer cliffs of 2,000 feet. And that was the first time that I really got to experience that, and it was magical because in Texas in the summer, it's hot. It doesn't change. Here, we go into the mountains, and you actually, depending on the elevation, you got you got cool. It was cooler at night. And so there you see seeing temperate flora. And as my uh, travels around the country expanded and I went to, say, New York to, to give a talk or something like that, I would go out in the woods and I would see a, a chamfili or some ericaceous plants. And then I would start connecting that with the same sort of plants that I was finding up at maybe nine or 10,000 feet in elevation in Mexico. Well, Lynn Luck introduced us to all that. So that's how magical that introduction was. I mean, to start to be able to position where you are. To me, that's really important, but only to me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of like a reference point. You know, it's like, how can you know how to attack a problem unless you know where you are in the world? Where's your position? Because it, it give you an example. It's kind of like when I'll ask people, I, they'll call me on the phone and... Uh, They'll say they want to grow a particular plant. And the first thing I, have to, I want to know, I say, where, where are you located? What's your elevation? What's your zone? I have all these questions. And most people now, because of computers, they think they're everywhere. They think they're, everything's the same. It's not the same. You have to know those elements. And that's what we learned in that okay. first trip to Mexico. And how did Lynn teach you these things? How was he as a guide or a mentor when you were on these trips to Mexico? Well, since he had been before, he basically laid the groundwork. He knew where to go, which is real important. I mean, uh, you could easily just take this road uh, and dead end into a big city, industrial city like Monterey, and could get a, you know, not such a favorable impression. But Lynn had been there, I don't know how many times before, uh, and he knew where to go. And so he basically taught us. He says, well... If you want to find woody plants, temperate plants, you need to go to this particular elevation. And he would bring out maps, and in the old Stanley volume, which was a 1921 book on the flora of northern Mexico, he'd bring this out, and he would say, well, now we're at 4,000 feet. Here you'll find the plants you would see in East Texas. There'll be hornbeans, which is carpinus, there may be dogwoods. So he started showing us the association. Oh, in this area, we're in a temperate woodland. So it, a lot of the plants we noticed were similar to East Texas. Then he pointed out by saying, well, this plant is similar to, uh, let's go for Styrax, for instance, snowbells. Uh, Styrax are found around the world. Well, he showed it to us in Mexico. He said, well, this Styrax... Another species is located in eastern Texas, and there's remnant populations, which is a word and a whole concept I'd never heard before until I met Lynn. He talked about remnant populations. He said, well, there's 
Styrax are also found in hill country, in remnant populations. What does that mean? Well, those like isolated little colonies, relic populations that are existing uh, from times past, since you know glaciation, when it's become drier, and these are basically plants that have been stranded. And then immediately my mind just kind of flashed like a light bulb going off. It's like, now I understand what's going on. These mountains are like literally islands where the climate was such that when the glaciers retreated and it became hotter and drier and that moisture was sucked up out of South Texas and Western Texas, that that chain of flora that existed from Nova Scotia went all the way down to Guatemala. And a lot of that was laid out by Lynn, not telling us that, but alluding to it by telling us that these plants are found in the eastern United States. Because I have no horticulture degree. I have no background in that. I have an incomplete degree in architecture and uh, philosophy. So uh, that's kind of how it unfolded. Well, speaking of that, can you say what it was about Lynn that that might have helped somebody with a very different kind of training and background, architecture and philosophy, um, to come to something like horticulture and being a nursing man, which is, seems, you know, a big job. Well, what I kind of left out is, as a child uh, in San Antonio, my earliest memories were going out into the local fields where I lived and uh, digging a, a cactus. I love cactus. And my mother and my grandmother were quite uh, avid gardeners and had grew a lot of things. So I was always going out and digging things up, which until today I didn't, you know, it same, seems natural that I found out that's exactly what Lynn did. Lynn did the same thing. So I, I was always dealing and associated with plants. Uh, even when I was in college, I had a, a cactus that I grew. And, I, and when I was in high school, I grew orchids and native plants. And um, growing up, even before that, in junior high, I remember my mom ordering hostas and Thompson seedless grapes and the catalogs that would come in the mail. And and, and and always wondering, why did these all fail? Why did they fail? You know, and the reason was, and well, I go back, I said, well, why didn't my cactus that I dug up, why didn't that fail? I could dig it up and move it into a, a, another area of rocky soil, because I lived in north of San Antonio, which is very caliche soils. Why did the hosta die and the cactus, why did it survive? Well, these things sort of unfolded very slowly. It wouldn't be until I was much older, you know, met other people like John Ferry, who I learned an immense amount of horticultural knowledge, and, and then uh, Lynn Lowry, that all this stuff starts to make sense. Now I know that hostas are native to Eurasia. They're found at certain elevations. They're found growing, usually festooned to waterfalls. That's where a sense of place is so important. You need to know where you are, because we're bombarded. Things fly over in airplanes and arrive at our doorstep, and most people have not a clue where they're from, or how they got there. And those are all the questions that you have to answer and have to be aware of. Well, you've talked a little bit about now uh, how your early upbringing and some of your times as a child or in high school or in college might have brought you to where you are today. I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about um, Lynn's impact on your career running Yakadu Nursery. How has that influenced you there? <laughs> that question I can't answer directly because he is based, uh, the whole nursery is a result of Lent. And uh, the nursery started the year before we went on our first trip to Mexico. And the nursery came about uh, as a desire to share some of the plants that we had uh, grown for Peckerwood Garden, because I was working in the gardens, that we had multiples of. Or when, when people, many of the plant nuts, as Lynn used to call them, would come by, that we'd have things to share, because there was no money exchange. It was just always exchanging plants. So I kind of grew up in the driveway. And being uh, uh, 
a student of philosophy, obviously, I was very concerned with why do we do this? What you know, we have to have a focus. What is the meaning of it? It's got to have you know, being real intent on a purpose. And at first, it really didn't have that first year did not have a focus. Well, after the first trip to Mexico in the second year of the nursery, I knew what the focus was going to be. It was all spelled out. It was the introduction of counterparts to our Texas natives. And that's how the nursery initially started out. What I mean by that is say that we have, let's go back to the Styrax analogy. We had Styrax, the snowbell. There is one native in eastern Texas. There's one native in the hill country. And there's reportedly one native in Mexico. At that time, that's all I knew. Uh, then reading in literature and, and, and the expanded uh, horticultural uh, contacts that we gained found out that, well, Styrax was also native to the Mediterranean. That it's also found, species are found in uh, California. Styrax just multiply like crazy in China. Wouldn't it be interesting to be able to promote an unknown plant, say like some of our Texas natives, by showing the relationship that it has to the Asians, which are very easy to sell because of the indoctrination of growing azaleas and camellias, the things we're brought up, uh, brought up with. And, you know, it's all in literature. As a kid, we grow up, we read about roses and tulips. You know, we don't read it. We don't, in our childhood stories, don't come up talk about uh, Texas natives. You see what I'm talking about? That's that. So there was a, there was a uh, connection there. It was an easy connection to make, and it was scientific. So we would say, uh, you could do nursery. Uh, uh, our purpose was to promote Texas natives by offering the Asian and Mexican and Southeastern counterparts. So we would try to promote Texas natives by offering plants that some people would be more familiar with. And so that's, and that was the root of the nursery. That's how it started. And so a lot of the plants that we would uh, sell we would go in and we'd have multiples of the same genus. They would be uh, Chemonanthus, which is a fringe tree. There's one native to eastern Texas, and uh, there's one native to China. The Chinese one's easy to sell. The Texas native one's not as, not as easy to sell because it's not as known. It doesn't have the marketing. So we used a counterpart, and that was all derived from what we learned from Lynn. We, we found out that there was a wider, wider plant world out there and how they were associated. So Lynn helped you connect this network of remnants and... Remnant populations and plants associated to one another. And that became uh, the jumping off point of having the nursery have a philosophy. That was our philosophy. Well, speaking, I guess, philosophically and, and generically, can you talk about um, if or how Lynn had an impact on landscape in general or horticulture or... You know, people's attitude about the outdoors beyond your life or beyond the scope of Yucca Do? Uh, I'm trying to really think here. I'm not quite sure I understand what the question, what you mean. Is, 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 what is his legacy? Or, yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, I think his legacy is engendering the love of growing anything or something and uh, I think it's his humility is a big part of that that uh, ego is extracted out of it which is a very difficult concept to get across to most people uh, it's just not something that's uh, taught in schools really I mean it's almost I mean Lynn comes across almost as a Maoist and or a Buddhist, and in some of his, I mean, he literally got rid of everything he owned all the time. He was getting. That's why he gave plants away. He didn't like things. He would create and propagate and grow and then disseminate, get it, get get rid of it. And money was only a necessity as far as paying the bills. And after that, it you know it was not important whatsoever. And you talk about a concept that's foreign to most people, especially young people now. I mean. That would be his legacy for most people is, is, is that humility and that uh, sense of seeing something that exists in, say, uh, a plant uh, that has yet to be realized. 
And so it's all just like potential. And uh, that's why it's really difficult to pinpoint Lynn. Because these are not things he said. These are things that he did and lived. And you had to, you had to, you had to see it in him. It's nothing he said. Like all the things I'm mentioning are things he did not say. Because you start to reflect, he's out of the room. He's gone. And matter of fact, I got along really well with Lynn because, not that he did not get along with people, but what I mean by that is, is that I would lower my head and get close to him when I talked with him or spoke with him. And I have a tendency to talk fast relative to Lynn because Lynn spoke very slow. And there would be gaps between his thinking, not his thinking, but between what he said. And it was so easy for people to not see that, you know, the good qualities that he had. You had to be aware. That's why I made the analogy that he was kind of like a comet. Because he's very bright to people who are willing to look and, and, and search out something. But it's nothing that you could grab a hold of. Well said. Is there anything that um, would you like to add about... There's one analogy, or one story I'd like to tell, because it's Please. 10 years or more in the making. I never forget Lynn uh, giving me a plant of, it's Carex cherokeeensis. It's a sedge. It's found all over the state. It's just, uh, at, at that time, 10 years ago, to me it was just another grass. But because Lynn gave it to me, and he was so absorbed in its qualities that it had. He knew that it was good, it had good qualities. It was a good planet. You could use it in dry shade or, you know, people are not, you know, I know you will appreciate that. This is kind of the statement he would make. I know you would, you'll find a good use for this. Try it. And at the time, when I'm thinking back on it, well, at, at the time it was like, I'm really going to look for qualities in this plant because he sees something in there that I don't see. I don't. It's a green blob, and but I know there's something in there. I know there's something in there. What is he seeing? But you had the experience. You had to find it. We had to grow it, which we did. We planted it, and it was just another green grass. But it wasn't a grass. It was a sedge. I wouldn't learn that till years later. And the plant was uh, either discarded, died, or something. And it wasn't you know, several years, five years back that I remember the name. I remember the name, Carex cherokeeensis. And I said, you know, this really is pretty. I was seeing it in the wild out near Hempstead, Waller County. I really think this would be a good plant to grow in as a substitute. And then it looks like it was that flashbulb again water crisis in the hill country. They're always having to restrict the use of water for lawns. This is a lawn substitute. It's good in dry shade. Because look, I'm trying to dig this thing out of the ground. I can hardly pry it out of the ground because of all the tree roots that are in it. This is August. This, the ground was bone dry and it still had kind of an ephemeral sort of early spring look to it. It was bright green. It wasn't tired looking. So maybe this is Texas monkey grass. Let's give it a good name brought it back to the nursery, started growing it. We've offered it in our nursery. And now I see attributes in that. And right now, that plant is being sold by Pat McNeil, who is a nursery, and who has also been influenced by, by Lynn, in Austin. And he has a nursery dedicated just to selling sedges. I sell another one called Flock of Sperma. We offer it through our website. Beautiful blue foliage. And... Uh, I almost get a chuckle when I think about it because these are plants that he, he wanted us to work with. Now, whether he knew what attributes it had, I don't know. It didn't matter. It was the passion, the energy that he presented it to you with that was the reason for growing it. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, helping us understand Lynn a little bit better. Appreciate it. Well, let me do a couple things. Um, I saw John was out there.